How's everybody doing out there? You excited about Christmas? Everybody done with their shopping? Oh, okay, I'll check on you next week. Uh, well, we have sermon notes. If you didn't receive any sermon notes, we have the ushers back there. Would you raise your hand? Because we have quite a few notes that are in there today, and we have a, quite a ground to cover this morning. So I'm going to do it as quickly as possible, because I'm actually com combining two things into one, and you'll see that in just a minute. But in honor of Pastor Bill and his love for FSU students, I have an FSU joke um, to start us off with. So there were these two FSU sorority sisters, and they were out doing some yard work in their backyard, and one of them had a weed whacker. She was doing the weed eating, and all of a sudden her cat ran in front of her, and she cut her cat's tail off by accident. So her friend was all upset about it. She says, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? She says, I'm going to Walmart. She goes, why would you go to Walmart? She goes, hello, retail, you know. <laughs> so anyway, th thank God we beat FSU this year. Well, if... If you uh, were here when I spoke back in late March, I spoke on part one. Today's part two, blessed to be a blessing and how to activate your faith. So we're going to get to that at the end. We have some exciting things I want to share with you to, to help you with that and also help see the church grow. I think that we can combine all this together. It's going to be great. So back in March, I shared a little over half of my business testimony of how God brought my family here to Gainesville, and it was very exciting for us, as, and so I'm going to share a, a little less than half of that in a condensed version, and then we're going to talk about how to activate your faith following that. So one of our two keynote scripture passages is Genesis 12, and we'll put that on the screen there, verses 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abraham, Ab Abram, he wasn't quite yet Abraham, he was going to be renamed Abraham later, but the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. Say to your, say to your neighbor, you shall be a blessing, because that's the promise. That's the promise of God. That is the original Abraham covenant that God spoke to Abraham. So then continuing on, it says, we'll bless those who bless you and curse, cur and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So this just really meant something. And we'll get to that in just a second for Brent and I, as we were going through an interesting time in 1988. So I'm going to share this business testimony. You might say, well, why pastor Pastor Carl, why do you want to share this business testimony? Well, it also says, and this is not on the screen, but I'll, if you want to write it down, Deuteronomy 8.18 says this, But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who is giving you power to make wealth, that He may confirm His covenant, which He swore to you as it is this day. So this was the covenant I just read. So the problem the Israelites, if you've ever read through the Old Testament, you'll know that they're always getting in trouble. And, and a lot of the time, one of the main issues of getting in trouble was they forgot to remember the good things and be thankful for the things that God had done because he did many miracles. And they were always forgetting about it and they were looking at their circumstances and they forgot what God did and they got in trouble, they got in sin and bad things happened. So that's a good scripture to start off with. So I'm going to review very quickly what, what I shared in March. And first of all, my entrepreneur background. And I, I think I must have inherited this from my grandfather on my father's side. We called him Bapa Cranes. He was from Miami. He was a realtor. He was quite a character. He was an entrepreneur. He did a little of everything. And I kind of did that too. I had a lot of things that didn't work out so well. He had that too. He wrote his own autobiography when he was 87 years old. And he had a chapter in it that said, how to make a million quick and lose it quicker. <laughs> so, so, that, so that was my Bapa. And I think I inherited it from him. So I, I did... As I shared before, I listed a lot of businesses and, and a lot of jobs that I had mo mainly in the 1980s and early 1990s. I counted at least 25 different things that, that I had tried to do. Some of them were okay, some of them didn't work out so okay. But really, we got to a landmark in our life that this is really the changing point. In 1988, I, uh, we were living in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we had Robert and Wesley, and Michael was just about to be born. And this is in early 1988, he was born in March. And I had started up a business venture of a very intricate uh, book that involved advertising for the whole city of Atlanta. And I had gotten the idea from Birmingham and tried to get it going, but 
it didn't work. So I lost a lot of money. I was in debt. And uh, I, felt like, I felt like God really spoke to me in, in late February just to shut it down. And I was just perplexed. I was saying, man, I thought God told me to do this, but this was the biggest disaster that I had ever done. And so I was, it was just, what, what do I do? What am, what am I going to do now? I'm in debt, and Michael's getting ready to be born any day. We owe the doctor. We owe the hospital. I don't have any money for paying our next month's rent. And lo and behold, I got my first ever eviction notice on the door. And I'm saying, Man, wait, wait, why, Lord? You ever had this why moment? You feel like you've been doing everything right, and all of a sudden, something like that happens? Because I'd been tithing, I'd been praying, I'd been part of my local church, I'd been faithful, and doing all the right things, but why did this still happen? Well, about that time, a friend of mine, who's my old jogging buddy back in Houston, Texas, uh, David, he gives me a call out of the blue, which I now know it was not out of the blue, and I started to tell him what happened. He goes, well, wow, isn't that interesting, Carl? I have gone through the exact same thing you did. He, he had three little children. He was a mechanical engineer, and no matter what he did, he was always in debt and always running out of money. So he told me, he said, Carl, one night I was just completely emotional about this. He says, I was literally laying on the floor, pounding the floor and saying, why God? And he was, he was contemplating, maybe I just need to get another part-time job. And he said, God spoke to me, says, yeah, you need to get another part-time job. You need to get a part-time job confessing my word. And he goes, wow. And he, just, he just said, wow, I need to do that. And he had been hearing, hearing about some of these, these faith preachers and people taught on the blessings of God. So he compiled his own list of confessions. It's three pages long. And he mailed them to me. And there, and there are some copies in the back. I, I shared this last time. If you want to pick up a copy, they're back there in the Connect Zone. And you're, you're welcome to have one at the end of the service. So... Uh, the difference between doing a lot of good things, which God saw my heart, but I was not really activated yet in faith with all these good things I was doing, and then this disaster happens. So he shared with me four things, and these are in your notes, and we'll start off with these, of principles or keys that changed his life. And he said, Carl, for the, number one, no matter what you just did, just re realize that you are God's son. He loves you, and he's not angry with you. And in your blank there, it says, God is for me. He's not against you. He's not angry with you. He's for you. And he says, you just need to make a decision that you're going to believe that God's for you. No matter what your emotions say, that God's for you, and he wants to turn the situation around no matter what you just went through. And I said, got it, David. Second thing. You're filling the blank there. Number two, confess God's promises. If you even want to write out to the side, and his blessings that are found in the Bible. Not just any old promises, promises that God has put in the Bible. He says you need to do those. And, and he said that was the number one practical thing that he did that changed his life. And I have to say it is definitely the number one practical thing that I've been doing for the last 30 years that has completely changed my life and given me a perspective on God that he wants to bless us. Number three, he said, listen to positive teachers, positive teachers on, that teach on God's blessings and promises, and I just love these guys back in the day. A lot of them are still around. One of my favorite one is uh, Jerry Savelle. I, I decided to go listen to his teaching on 2019 last night. It was, just, it was just totally awesome. It was just like the old days. And so I listened to, to positive teachers on God's blessings and promises and actually, I'd been a little skeptical about those kind of people before because I was in a, a church that some of the people in my church said, don't listen to those people. They're just fanatics and they're just overboard on faith and, they, and, I'm, and all this kind of stuff. So a lot of negative things, but, you know, I was desperate. I was desperate and I said, you know, David, if this worked for you, I'm going to do it. And so I just found these guys were not that overboard. They, weren't, they were actually using God's word and it made a big difference in my life. And, and uh, number four, give a seed offering, seed offering. And what does that mean? It's just like Pastor Bill said last week when he, and when he was sharing about, when he took up the offering, actually. Uh, this is not in your notes either, but it's uh, Luke 6, 38 was the offering scripture. It says, give and it shall be given to you or given back to you, good measured, pressed down, shaken together, running over, they will pour it into your lap. For by your standard of measure, or the measure that you give, it will be given back to you. So 
We're not subtracting something when we plant a seed. It's like Pastor Bill shared last week. We're planting a crop so that when we give into whatever God leads us to give, we're going to get a blessing back. So I started confessing these scriptures. David mailed them to me. We, don't, we didn't have email back then. I had to wait and get in the mail. And that's actually the, the uh, copy of the original papers that he, that he gave me back, the typed out on the old typewriter version that are in the back back there. And I still use those, and Brenda used, and I confess them to this very day. So still, I was in a dilemma. So I started these scriptures, started saying them, and within about a week or two, my old business partner, I used to live in Baton Rouge, calls me up, and we used to do an apartment guide in Baton Rouge, and he had done one the year before for graduate schools in Dallas. He calls me and says, Carl, I need somebody to come and redo the sales of this apartment guide in Dallas, Texas. Would you be willing to do it? And I'm going, oh, of course, yes, I need something to do. So I told him yes, but this just so happened to be the city where my friend David lived that had just given me the scriptures. He lived in Dallas, Texas now. So I was able to go stay with him in his house temporarily, and while we were there, I was thinking about on the way, because I had an old 1978 Chrysler LeBaron that kept breaking down all the time. It would overheat. I had to pull over. It was always being worked on. And I just had a desire in my heart for, an, uh, for a new Subaru station wagon. That was just in my heart. I'd, I'd, I had a friend, that, and, and I had a family getting Now it was three, because Michael had been born at this time. And we needed the room. So I go there. And I watched a testimony. I was saying these scriptures, staying with my friend David. I saw a testimony on TV of this young man, younger than me, who's a business guy. And he, was, and he was believing for a car, and it was a station wagon. It's like, what? It just lit up inside of me. I said, man, if that guy can do it, I can do it. I said, I just, I just believe God wants me to have a station wagon. So I, I, and, and then at that same time, we had, we had a, a barter, we were doing an apartment guide, so one of the apartment properties uh, allowed Brennan and me and my family to go live there while we were doing this apartment guide sales time. So I, I called Brenda up and I said to her, Brenda, man, I just feel like we're going to get a Subaru station wagon. I'm going out to find one, she goes. And, but she knew something was different this time because in the past... I had always had, I didn't have bring my calculator with me. I would, I would, you know, and you need to do this in a certain respect. You need to plan. I was a planner. I was always looking at things and trying to fix things and everything. So I had my little calculator out all the time because I was always, my, my, my finances were like this, like a yo-yo because I was in sales and a lot of commissions. So I was always trying to figure it out and fix it, but I was still getting in debt. I was in debt to the, I'll admit it, I was in debt to the IRS twice in the 1980s and I was paying them back and I was currently paying them back in 88 when this happened. But she knew something was different this time. She could sense faith in my heart had exploded inside of me. She goes, okay, go out and get it. <laughs> so she started packing up and uh, I was getting ready to bring the boys to, to meet us there in, in Dallas and stay in the apartment property. And while she was there, this goes back to our keynote scripture. She pulled out a chest of drawers. Inside of the chest of drawers was a page of the Bible that had been torn out somehow. I know God did it. We didn't know how it got there. But it was Genesis 12, 1 through 3, the Abrahamic covenant was in her drawer. And as she touched it, it actually had warmth to it, she said. She could feel a warmth. It was like the Holy Spirit was, was heating it up. So she just knew that something was different. Something had happened to Carl that he ha now had an element of faith that before was always trying to fix things, which is really fear. I didn't realize it was a fear at the time, but it really was fear. But I had changed. And so we, uh, we got the Subaru station wagon. I shared that. You can go back and look at the, the, the other uh, teaching I did. And then um, while we were there, I had not paid my taxes yet. So I knew that I was in trouble with the IRS again. And, and then so while I was at the apartment property, they forwarded, we, forwarded me the letter, which I'd seen in past days, uh, past years. And on it, I was expecting to see Mr. Cranes, you owe this amount in tax and, and uh, interest and penalties and all that. And I, so I just put it on the desk. Finally, two or three days later, I finally opened it up to read it. And it says, I said, what? It says, Mr. Cranes, you did not take the proper credits that you deserve to take for your taxes. So we are sending you a check for 300 and something dollars. I'm going, what? <laughs> so I actually thought I owed 600 something. And they send me back and check. I, I've never heard that story. Anybody ever tell that ever? And then, you know, that when does the IRS redo your taxes for you? You know, I, I don't know, but they did. So it must have been an angel or something. I don't know. So we finished up our sales in Dallas. This is where I'm picking up. And I'm going to go through a Cliff Notes version of where we went 
on the next several months. This whole experience in 1988 took about nine months. It seemed like it was forever, but it was, it was such an awesome um, adventure of faith. That's what Jerry Savelle calls his teachings. If you ever look him up, he's a great teacher. It was really an adventure for us. So I, we were finishing up our sales. I had just a little bit of money, not much left in my wallet, so to speak, when we finished up our sales period in Dallas. I said, where do we go to next? And it popped into my brain, Grand Isle, Louisiana. Now, you probably don't know what Grand Isle, Louisiana, unless you've been to Louisiana before. It's a little beach town at the very bottom. It's the only beach in Louisiana that there is, a legitimate beach. It's a long island down there. And me and my buddies, when I used to live in Baton Rouge, would go fishing there. <coughs> Excuse me. And one time while we were down there, we stayed with this cabins down there, and we stayed overnight. And I, re I remembered I had this lady's business card in my wallet. So I took it out, and there's a name. Her name was Janice. And this idea came to me, why don't you call her and say, hey, I'm going to start a visitor's guide for your town, and I would like your, your uh, little apartments to be on it. Would you be willing to barter with me, and I'll put you on one of the cover ads? And so I called her up, and lo and behold, she said yes. <laughs> she didn't know anything about what was going to happen, but she said yes. So we packed up the Subaru. I mean, it was packed. And we went down to Grand Isle, lived down there for about two or three weeks, and we put together the first ever visitor's guide for Grand Isle, Louisiana, and got it distributed. So that took about three weeks or so. We had a good time down there. Got a little fishing in Pastor Bill while I was down there, a little surf fishing. He knows I, some of y'all know I like to fish. But when we were finished, I had, again, just a little bit of money, maybe just a tiny bit more than the last time, but not much, a little bit of money. And so another thought popped into my mind. I said, well, where can I do something like this? An apartment guide, a visitor's guide? So I said, I'm going to go to Galveston because I used to live in Houston. And in Houston, we would go down and do fishing trips and have fun down in the jetties and off the piers in Galveston. And so I just knew that area down there. I said, I bet they need something. They need, maybe they need a tourist guide. So I went down there. They already had a tourist guide. So I was driving around, but I found out they didn't have an apartment guide. So I had apartment guide background, so I talked to some people, and guess what? I did for them the first, to my knowledge, the first ever apartment guide for Galveston, Texas uh, in the sum late summer of 1988. So that took me, we had a little barter there, we stayed in an apartment right across the beach, we had a great time, and then I ran out of money again, and so I had a little bit of money, but I, I was thinking, now where do I go from here? And I couldn't think of anything. I thought... No, I don't know where to go. So the only thing I could think of is I need to go back to a local church that I knew somebody at in Houston, Texas, in the ministry that I grew up in, and then go there and, and keep, keep thinking, keep looking. And so I went there, and I couldn't think of anything. And we, we stayed with a couple families, Then we were finally in a one-bedroom garage apartment, the, the five of us, in a one-bedroom garage apartment. And I finally decided I just need to get a job. So I got a part-time job, a Christmas sales job, with uh, UPS loading trucks and then I also got uh, about a week later a job with Radio Shack and so I was working on that but now I had completely run out of money and this is what I knew somehow I knew this time was going to come I was going to get tested whether I believed this that God was a blessed blessing kind of God or not because this was a real test for us and uh, but I did get these two positions but they don't pay for two or three weeks because as you all know paychecks run in cycles and you don't get a paycheck as soon as you're finished in most cases and that was typical of these larger companies so Brenda got really sick I mean really sick when we were there Michael our newborn he's like seven eight months old he he reaches up touches the stove and burns his hand badly in the stove in this apartment so we needed to go to the doctor we had no money to go to the doctor and God just worked it out miraculously somehow we were a doctor was able to see uh, Michael and her and take care of that but we were out of money we were down literally to beans and rice Beans and rice is all that we had left for a couple of days. And I, Brenda was frustrated. I was frustrated. And I was just praying one night. And I'm saying, Lord, and I just, he said, this is your wilderness, Carl. I mean, he spoke to me. Are you going to believe me? Are you believing that this is for real and this is forever? And I'm thinking, yes, Lord, I believe you. I'm, and I had my scriptures and I was confessing my scriptures. The next day, we get, as Pastor Bill likes to pray, a surprise check in the mail. <laughs> The very next day when I woke up, it was from my friend David that had originally given me all these scriptures. He sent us a $25 check. 
you would have thought we got a million dollar check. We were so excited because we had zilch zip nada at the time. And we had made a decision. We weren't borrowing any more money. We'd gotten ourselves in enough trouble borrowing money as it was. And we made that decision. We're not borrowing money. That's not to say you shouldn't ever borrow money. But that was our decision at that time. So we celebrated. We went out and spent about almost half of that at Grandy's Chicken. Does anybody remember Grandy's Chicken? You know, that they're, they're, uh, they, it, you, you know where PDQ is. That used to be Grandy's Chicken, fried chicken. We just loved that, and we went there and celebrated. So, um, but still, that's all the money we had gotten, and we, paychecks weren't due in for at least another week. And so we were kind of in a little dilemma right then. And so one day over at Radio Shock, I worked there in the, in the daytime, did UPS in the, in the early morning hours at 2 in the morning, and, the, and um, we were just out of money again. I mean, it just ran out. So... The manager goes, y'all, I got to tell you something. He said, this never happens. It ne I said, I've been here a long time. This just never happens. He says, your paychecks just came in a week early. And so we literally had that first paycheck that came in, and this kind of gave, get, got us back up on the upswing, the UPS check come in, and so things improved for the end of December of 1988. Well, we decided, I took another job, by the way, and I just had an uncomfortable feeling that, I don't know, I mean, I, I did a couple sales with it, then we told them we're going to go visit my parents down in Orlando, so we packed up the, the car, took the kids to Orlando, and while we were driving on New Year's Eve, uh, we didn't know it until we got to my parents' house in Orlando, my grandmother, who lives out in Trenton, she suddenly passed away and, um, of, a, of a heart attack, and that was it, so... Uh, we we uh, came the next morning to Trenton, to, and as we were driving, we, we said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if they, if they offered us to house at this house? And we kind of laughed about it, and she said, wouldn't it also be cool if they gave us her car? And we laughed about that, and, you know, lo and behold, she gave us the car. No, none of my other brothers wanted the car. It was almost a brand new car, so we had two cars now, and they let us house at the house for a couple of months, and it was full of food. My, my grandmother stored the pantry to the max, and, and we had all the food we needed. So, it, I mean, this isn't God good. That was, just, that was just awesome. Awesome. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. So a couple months later, I, I uh, w always wanted to do my version of a coupon book that I had learned to do in Baton Rouge. We, I used to work on a book there for the LSU Tigers. Don't anybody boo or anything. And so... Uh, I decided I was going to go to the University of Florida and meet with the student union because our sponsor in LSU was the student union. So I go meet with them, explain everything. He goes, I said, Carl, this is an interesting idea. We're going, to, we're going to give a call to LSU. I didn't know this, but the different student unions around the country know each other. They have conferences together. They know them by name at LSU. And so she calls them up. She goes, oh, Greg was my partner. They said, oh, Greg and Carl, we love those guys. This thing was super popular here. You're going to love it. So without knowing that I was in debt to my eyeballs, uh, they didn't know that. They said, we want to not only we think it's a good idea, we're going to sponsor your book. We're going to help distribute your book. We're going to give you a cover letter to take around to the businesses saying what we're going to do. We're in it with you, Carl. We're excited for it. So that's how Gator Greenbacks got started. A lot of you know that we own the coupon book. We try to give them out at the beginning of each semester. It... it it took off with a real bang. I mean, it was just, people were signing up. I was just shocked how many people signed up. And it's been really that way ever since. And it's been a blessing now for almost 30 years. And we're, we just thank God for that. So that's the quickie version of how we showed up in Gainesville, Florida, doing the Gator Green Vax. There's a lot more, but maybe some other time I'll tell you some other stories. So let's go to the net part two, how to activate your faith. And on your questionnaire, it says, does everyone have faith? And the answer is no, not everyone has faith. Because in 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, it says that we may be delivered from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. So not everybody has faith. They may have, they may have confidence, but they don't have faith. Number two, do you and I as believers in God, do we have faith? And the answer is, yes, we do. Romans 12, 3 says, Through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think is to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each, each a measure of faith. So, we each have faith. Not just Pastor Bill has faith and Rebe Miss Rebecca or myself or 
Miss Brenda or Miss Lelaine and Pastor Mike or Billy Graham when he was in, no, each of us has a measure. One version says the measure of faith. So you have the exact amount of faith that God has given inside of you to accomplish the things he has for you. So Romans 10, 17, this will be your next fill in the blank, says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes. Faith doesn't just float in onto you out of the sky and, you know, everybody has faith. No, it, you have it inside of you, but something else has to happen. So let's look at that word comes. So how does faith come to us? Well, let's look at our other keynote scripture in Philemon, Philemon 1.6, and it says this. It says that I pray that the communication, or one version says fellowship of, another says the sharing of your faith becomes more effective by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you for Christ's sake. So circle that word acknowledging. That's going to be our key word moving forward here, acknowledging. So when we talk about faith coming to us, this scripture clearly says if you want to communicate better, you want to share your faith better, share who you are in Christ better, you have to acknowledge something. That's why we have the scriptures to acknowledge because faith is built from acknowledgings. So how do we acknowledge? We say it out loud. That's how we acknowledge it because then we hear it because we go back to Romans 10, 17. It says faith comes by hearing. So we say it out loud. So I like to read my Bible out loud. You know, as long as I'm not interrupting somebody, I like to read it out loud because there's some principle going on there that the scripture clearly shares with us that faith comes by hearing God's word. So I like to say it out loud. And actually, there, there, in, in our memory scriptures, there's one scripture that talks about meditating on the word of God day and night so that you'll be careful to do according to all that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and then, then you will have good success. King James says good success. We don't want bad success, we want good success. So the word meditate actually means to say under your breath. So it does mean say out loud. That's what it meant in Hebrew is you kind of said it under your breath. So it's not just a good idea, it's a scriptural principle to meditate or say God's word out loud. So then the last fill in the blank says this, faith is developed and activated, developed and activated. So we have to do something about our faith. I had not done that prior to this miraculous nine-month journey. You know, God provided for us, and there was things that he did. I'm not saying that God wasn't in our lives. He was in our lives. But God was trying to get something through to me about how to walk by faith and not by calculating everything and trying to figure everything out, how to walk by faith. So what Brenda and I do is not every morning, but regularly when we get up and pray for different people in our lives, we take these scriptures that are back there on, in the connect zone, and we take turns saying them out loud. And that's what we've done uh, regularly for quite a long time. So those, those uh, scriptures are on mainly the blessings of God, the prosperity of God, there's general blessings, but they are, they're, they're just, there are hundreds and hundreds of them in scripture. Those are just a few. You can do your own word study and, and do some on your own. However, you can say scriptures that involve many subjects, and we'll talk about it in Ephesians 6 in a second when we do a confession. So how about the subject of evangelism or church growth? That's a great idea, isn't it? Because we want to see our church grow. We want to see people come into the kingdom of God. So there are scriptures on that because the Bible says all of God's promises, all of them, say all, all are yes and amen. So they're there. They're possible for us to inherit those promises. So in your, uh, your uh, handout, your worship guide, there should have been a prayer, friendship prayer list. It looks like this. So in a minute, we're going to tie this all together with this friendship prayer list. So what is this for? Uh, the founder of the ministry that uh, Pastor Bill and Rebecca and me and Brenda were in, I talked to him a couple years ago, and he was sharing about a, a list like this. He travels all over the world, and he went to Sweden, and he was at a church there, and he had had this idea of this friendship prayer list. And so uh, what it is, is that you make a list of a few people that come to mind that you want to pray for, for their salvation, for them to come to know the Lord. And on that, uh, itemize one or two of them that you really want to focus on that you can get to know. So by getting to know them, 
You strategically pray for divine appointments. Say, Lord, I want to get to know this person. I'd like to invite them to go out to the movie. I'd like them to come over and eat. Whatever it is to do something with them, become their friends. That's why this is a friendship prayer list. And so God will, he will set them up if you'll do this. If you'll pray in faith and pray your scriptures, God will do this for you. And when um, the pastor Bob took this to Sweden, they had a church, not, not that much bigger than our church, about 100, 150 people, and they, they started to do this. They didn't change anything else. They didn't bring in an evangelist. They, I don't know what they did with small groups, but they, they did this, and they grew in about a year to over 1,000 people. That, that's all they did was the congregation. They didn't depend upon the pastor to do it for them, and pastors do a great job. I'm so thankful for Pastor Bill and all the people that work and the dream teams. You guys are awesome. But this is all they did. Is they prayed this uh, friendship prayer list. So if you'll take that home with you and think about, you might have somebody in mind right now that you want to put on there and start praying for them. So we're going to do a confession one of those confessions, but I'm going to do a little longer one, because what I like to do, now Pastor Bill talked about last week, the Lord's Prayer, how you can pray the Lord's Prayer, it was a couple weeks ago, you can, you can pray the, the elements of the Lord's Prayer, and I've done that. I also like to pray Ephesians 6, because there's elements that says, talk, talks about putting on the armor, the full armor of God. So one of those pieces of armor is preparing your shoes with the gospel of peace. That's one of the pieces of armor, so we need to put that on. Now, how do we put that on? And that will, that will increase your divine appointments, your opportunities to know people and to help facilitate getting them to know the Lord and things like that. So how do we do that? Well, we take a scripture. So what I've done is I've taken that portion of the armor of God in Ephesians 6, and I've taken a, a, several scriptures, and I put them together and put them in the first person. So what we're going to do here, this might feel a little awkward. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this with me, but just go with it. Go with me on this. And uh, there's a couple scriptures right at the end under your last uh, fill in the blank that, that are involved, and there's, there's several others that are in here, Proverbs 28, 1, Revelation 12, 11, and 2 Corinthians 5, 20. But let's just pra practice confessing. God's word and let's see what you feel like when we're done so just we're going to go through this this is a prayer but I want you to do this repeat after me I am ready in season and out of season to give an account of the hope that lies within me the wicked flee when no one is pursuing but I your righteous one is, am as bold as a lion, as as a lion. To, share to share my faith. I'm also a wise soul winner, I'm also a wise soul winner. because he who wins souls is wise. So I call divine appointments of lost people, of lost people to come across my path, across my path. and be snatched out of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of God through the words, through the words actions, actions, and deeds, and deeds of, you, Lord, of you, Lord, working wisely, working wisely mightily, mightily, and boldly, and boldly through, me today, through me today and every day. And every day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Mighty name, amen. So that activates our faith. We're taking that principle. We're applying it to lost souls. We're speaking that over them every day. And I have had divine appointment after divine appointment to share my faith. And I just get in this mentality. It's not easy because our flesh doesn't want to share Jesus with people. Let's just be real. I, I'm not saying I do it because I'm something special, but I've had to work at this. I've had to say these scriptures. I had to work at things like in the restaurants of asking my server, can I pray for you? It, it just it doesn't come naturally. I've got to think about it and got to do it. So as you do this, I, did anybody feel anything when they, when they, when they shared, when, the, when we did that confession just then? It, it does something to you. Over the years, I've felt in numbers of time and I would just stop on a scripture and do that. But it's like lifting weights. If, some, if there's a bully in your neighborhood, 
and you've never lifted weights, you can't just run inside your garage and lift weights real quick and think you're going to be strong and whoop that bully. No, you're not. So this is daily, just like a relationship with God is daily. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a prayer will get you started. And we're going we're gonna to say a prayer right now to get you started on a relationship with God because that's what this is all about. It's, and, the, and it's the greatest two commandments which Pastor Bill shared last week. One is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. And the other one is to love your neighbor as yourself. What is the greatest love we could do for a neighbor is to direct them to that relationship with God. That is the greatest thing we can do for any neighbor that we have. So find out who your neighbors are on your prayer, on your prayer list and begin praying for them. So if you'll bow your head, I would like to just pray for you right now. And then I'm going to pray for divine appointments for people. Lord, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for, for all that you've given us. We, we are thankful, Lord, that you have delivered us out of darkness and transferred us into your kingdom, Lord Jesus. And we praise you and thank you. And I pray, Lord, for divine appointments for everyone as they begin to make their prayer list, as they begin to confess what the scripture says about them, that you'll ignite our faith, you will activate our faith. And Lord, we will go into this new year seeing testimony after testimony. And, and Lord, we just thank you for that so much, so much. So. Uh, right now, with everyone to just keep their head bowed, and you say, well, Pastor Carl, I don't, I've not really started this adventure of faith that you're talking about. I've not started a relationship with, when you said relationship with God, that I haven't really started that, but I'd like to. I'd like to know for certain that, that I'm going to go to heaven. If you're not sure, the Bible says you can be sure. First John 5, it says that he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And I write these things to you in order that you may know, that you can know that you have eternal life. So God is for you. He's cheering for you right now. If you're not sure, or maybe you're in a category number two, where you said a prayer like this at one time, but you've, you've gone kind of on your own way and gotten off track, and today the Lord's speaking to you that you need to get back on track. So if you say, Pastor Carl, I'm going to pray this prayer to follow Jesus for the first time, or I need to get back on track, and I'd like to do that. Uh, without anybody looking and around, because I don't want to embarrass you, I'm not going to ask you to stand up, but just raise your hand and say, Pastor Carl, can you pray for me? I want to get back on track today, or I want to follow you for the first time. If you raise your hand, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a little prayer for you in just a moment. Anybody? Thank you. Anybody? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and congregation, let's just say this prayer... If you raise your hand, or maybe you didn't have the courage to raise your hand right now, but you know you need to do this, just pray it. God hears you right now. Pray this with us, and this will change your lives. So say, Dear, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sins. And right now, I believe you raised him from the dead. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of all of my sins, come into my life, cleanse me, make me into the person you want me to be. And right now, I declare Jesus, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, I'm a Christian, and I'm going to heaven. Thank you, Lord. Let's give the Lord thanks for that. And thank you so much. Praise the Lord.